This I just thought was an interesting quote uh, from William Darlington, 1859. Just again emphasizes that we've been dealing with weed management issues ever since the first seed was planted intentionally in the ground. Weeds are something we're going to always have to deal with. We don't have a weed triangle like we have a disease triangle because no matter what the environmental conditions are we're always going to have problems with weeds. If it's a dry year we're going to have problems with certain weeds. If it's a wet year we're going to have different weeds. If it's hot, cold, doesn't matter, we're always going to have weed issues. Just by the very nature of weed biology weeds will always be a problem so uh, to job security that way. From my perspective, one of the things that I get a lot of questions on are just due to people's misunderstanding or um, lack of knowledge about basic weed biology. So the first part of this talk, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about weed biology, give people just some key points, you know, might be something that you're all very familiar with. Uh, some of your clientele you would be surprised have no understanding about weeds at all. Uh, so that's why I did that. Then the second portion we'll talk a little bit about cultural controls and then the end as more uh, things like chemical control and that. Weed biology, this is a definition that I had to learn uh, in graduate school from Dr. Harold Coble. It's very long, uh, complex, and it came up, the basic key point about this, it's all about things that are disturbed or occupied by mankind. Weeds have an anthropomorphic focus. If people weren't trying specifically to grow plants or use a landscape environment, uh, something like that, there would be no such thing as a weed because plants are just plants. They aren't good, they aren't bad, they're just what they are. But because we're specifically trying to do things and in the home environment, whether it's grow a nice uh, bedding plant uh, in front of the house, a vegetable garden, a home orchard, something like that. That's where weeds can become an issue is because the weeds are competing with the plants that we're specifically trying to grow. Weeds are higher plants. They do have a vascular system uh, unlike mosses. Uh, they have a different biology than rushes. They have a different biology than horsetails. You know, different plants have different types of biology. Grasses and broadleaves are typically how we weed scientists break plants down because there are distinct differences between the physiology that you see in grasses and in broadleaves. There's always some exceptions out there, but this is a very good way to break this down. Typically, there are chemicals out there that affect certain metabolic pathways in the grasses that don't affect those uh, pathways in broadleaves because they are different in the enzymes and the way the plants grow and things. Also one of the key factors that I like to emphasize and that's important for this type of talk where you're trying to think about lower uh, input, less harsh chemical manufacturing is just the basic meristematic growth of the plants. Where are the growing points in the plant? With grasses, your growing points are typically located down near the base of the plant when the plants are small and growing. With broadleaf weeds, the growing points are at the nodes all the way up the plant. I know a grower who had a nice pumpkin patch. You know, he didn't want to spray a lot of harsh chemicals. He thought he would go out and use a weed trimmer to clean up his pumpkin patch. It's a very good approach, very low input. You know, it was half an acre. It wasn't a huge planting or anything, but it was still a good size planting. Took him the better part of a day to get that taken care of. The problem that we ran into after he called me back, you know, two weeks later and said, I spent all this morning out there doing this and now the weeds are right back. And I went out and looked at him, talked to him a little bit to see what was going on. The issue was with the weed trimmer, he wasn't getting low enough. He wasn't getting below the cotyledons on the broadleaf plants. So yeah, he was trimming it off up here, but all these axillary buds that are along the stem just sprouted up again and began to regrow. If he had cut them below the cotyledons, that would have killed off all the broadleaf weeds right there. With grasses, you know, if you can get them very short, unless you can get that uh, growing point that's typically buried very low in there, grasses are going to grow back more that way than broadleaf plants will. Uh, also, uh, 
whether it's a perennial or an annual will have an impact on how effective something like that is. But just a basic understanding of, you know, if he had just lowered his trimmer a little bit lower and got lower in the plant, it would have made all the difference in the world in his weed management. Annuals, um, invariably we get people that are out there, it's late in the summer, they say, you know, do I need to go in and continue trying to manage the weeds? You know, occasionally I'll slip up and say control weeds, but you never really control weeds, you manage weeds. Uh, you know, you can't make weeds do certain things, but we try and manage the impact that they have. Annuals are plants that live for one growing season, whether it's a summer annual, a summer annual is something that will germinate in the springtime, grow through the summer, flower, produce seed, and die, or a winter annual. Our winter annuals are now germinating out there. They're gonna germinate now, they're gonna grow, they'll go dormant during the winter time. Come spring, they'll then start regrowing, flower, and die next spring. I see that a lot, one of the, uh, crops that I work with a lot is annual plastic culture strawberry production and one of our biggest weed issues in that is chickweed if they don't use uh, an herbicide. That's going to be a big problem for growers because it'll start growing now. It'll overwinter under those row covers that we put out. When they uncover their strawberries in the spring there's going to be a lot of chickweed there that they have to then come in and pull out by hand just to let the strawberries grow better. But you know, the secret with controlling annuals is you need to get them before they flower. Yeah, if you don't get them before they flower, they can still be a problem because weeds will compete with your crop plant or whatever you're trying to specifically grow. They'll compete for nutrients, your fertilizers that you're putting down. They'll compete for water. They'll compete for light. They'll actually physically compete for space. Uh, but if you, the bigger issue is the amount of seeds that they produce. I mean, yes, uh, you know, a Palmer amaranth weed, you know, they can get six and a half, seven feet tall and uh, be very competitive in a vegetable production situation. But something like uh, common purslane that's a low growing plant, we see it a lot in our gardens in the summer. It germinates when it's warm, it's got thick fleshy leaves and things. That's not going to be as competitive a low growing prostrate plant as a tall plant. But if you interrupt the seed production, okay, you've killed that plant off, it's not going to be a problem next year. Because that old saying that people say about one year seeding equals seven years of weeding, well, you know, that's actually pretty accurate because plants do produce a lot of seeds. Biennial growth pattern, these typically aren't too much of a problem for your average homeowners. These are problems in long roadsides, waste areas, and things like that. These are a plant that will germinate from seed, they'll grow, they'll go dormant. They typically will have a rosette pattern that first year will grow low on the ground and things. Uh, so even if they're mowing in their lawns or whatever, they can mow right over the top of those and it doesn't do anything to the plant. But then they go dormant. Then the second year they begin growing again and then they flower and die and produce seed. These are becoming more of an issue in no-till situations and things like that where growers aren't tilling their fields every year and that. Because if you break that growth pattern uh, at this dormant cycle here before it begins its second vegetative growth season, it's not going to be a problem either because it's not going to produce seed. Uh, chicory, Queen Anne's Lace are two of the most common uh, plants like that you'll, you'll run into. This is something that a lot of growers struggle with are your perennial plants. Perennial plants are those that will grow from seed, they'll live for one year, um, they'll produce seed, but they don't die. They have some form of structure that allows them to overwinter, whether it's tubers or nutlets or rhizomes or stolons or just some various form of overwintering structure. These can be a real problem for growers. Uh, if they're new growers, if they don't get these taken care of before they go into production, they're just gonna be fighting them forever. Uh, particularly if you're putting in a perennial fruit crop, uh, something like 
blackberries or raspberries, that's a serious issue because once you establish those plants in the area, the blueberries and that, you're not going to come back in and then try and till up around your blackberries and your blueberries and things. So you got to get your perennial weeds under control that uh, before you plant. And a vegetable garden or something where you're always tilling it up, it can also become an issue because as I said, these have overwintering structures, uh, something like yellow nut sedge. If you till that up, you can actually move those nutlets down the row and you're just spreading your problem. Uh, purslane, I mentioned it before, it has a thick fleshy stem. If you have 30 purslane plants in your garden and you come through, uh, with a hoe and you chop that up, you'll end up with 300 purslane plants that are a problem. So you need to understand a little bit about how the plants grow, how they reproduce and things in order to make good recommendations about how best to control them. These are some of the criteria that make weeds very successful. Uh, again, will just help you to think about things. High reproductive output. Uh, this is a sort of project that years ago graduate students in botany would sit around and they would uh, sit around and count the number of seeds that are produced by various plants. This is an old reference out there uh, by Dr. Stevens from 1932 in the American Journal of Botany. The reason I put that in there is, as I read through that article, there are plants that produce anywhere from thousands of seeds to hundreds of thousands of seeds. But that's just for a plant at a particular growth stage. If you think about, if you control all your annual pigweed, your red root pigweed, your uh, palmeranth and that, do a great job controlling them during the growing season, but I'm sure you've all got growers that get tired of weeding their garden by about the middle of August. So they just say, well, I'm not going to worry about it. Whatever weeds grow, I'm not going to worry about. Well, even a small pigweed that germinates the 1st of August only gets this tall before you get a frost or something like that. That could easily produce hundreds of seeds. So even those weeds that are late germinating, they still need to be managed in some way because whether it's a pigweed that produces 250,000 seeds or a pigweed that produces 500 seeds, that's potentially 500 new seedlings next year. So they always need to be thinking about sanitation. Sanitation is critical uh, in weed management, just like in disease management, trying to manage your insects or anything else. More than one mode of reproduction, that's where we're talking about the perennial weeds and things, whether it's through nutlets or stolons, stem cuttings, uh, we run into a lot of this issue now uh, with the heavy rains we've had this year, a lot of flooding. You know, if anybody had Johnson grass in their fields, some of those rhizomes got stirred up, washed down. You'll see it growing all along wherever it was flooded. May not have been a problem before, but if uh, you get soils that are flooded, a lot of these perennial weeds can come in and things. That's why it's very important. Uh, one thing that I always like people to do, you don't have to do this now, everybody's got smartphones, I'm sort of a low-tech guy, but just stick a pocket notebook in your back pocket and carry a pencil with you. Make little notes and recommend that to your growers as they're out walking through their field. Say, you know, I'm seeing this problem. I hadn't noticed it before. You know, as you're getting older, I, I know at least for me, my memory's going. I don't remember things as well as I did 30 years ago. Uh, so I like to write it down and then I've got the reference. Or even now, one of the advantages we have, I'm old enough, I remember when people used to mail me samples through the mail and things, or, and I'd have to identify them. Now you've got a smartphone, you just click a picture of it, email it off to the specialist. You know, we can do a pretty good job with pictures and that that are emailed to us and that for identification that. So take advantage of the technology. I'm not really a techno guru myself, but take advantage of the technology. Do what you can and uh, we can help you out with that. Plants are very efficient users of limited resources. Um, I have growers that I work with that put out sweet potatoes. They like sweet potatoes because there's not many disease problems with them. There's very few insect problems with them. And they figure if there's not many insect or disease problems, they're very low input so they don't even bother to fertilize them. Uh, they wonder why their sweet potatoes don't grow. And it's because they don't fertilize them. But uh, surprisingly, the weeds will do very well even in fields that don't have any fertilizer on them. So weeds will take advantage of whatever nutrients are out there. They'll take 
take advantage of whatever moisture is out there. Part of my graduate work was actually dissecting the root system on pigweed plants and analyzing it compared to soybean plants and that. So I know more about the root system of pigweed plants and things than I care to know. And trust me, they have huge root systems. Uh, discontinuous germination. Think about that packet of seeds that you buy at southern states or wherever it is. Put it out. You plant that. Typically, every seed in that packet is going to germinate within 24 hours of every other seed in that packet when it's planted. Weeds aren't like that. There are different levels of dormancy in the seeds on plants. So after they uh, are released and lay in the soil, they will germinate throughout the growing season. You don't typically get one big flush of weeds that you can come in, kill them all off, and you're done with weeds for the season. They do have discontinuous germination, early germination and growth. Some of the first plants that you see in the spring that are growing are weeds. Ability to withstand environmental extremes and catastrophic conditions, floods, drought, fire, all that sort of stuff. And high dispersibility, just think about things like the dandelion seedlets that the kids blow and everything else. Weeds are very good at dispersing themselves around. So. You know, I'm also a beekeeper. Uh, I like to see a nice diversity of plants on a farm. Uh, I always tell people, you know, it's nice to see different plants growing in the fence rows and things, but that's downwind of where you're trying to grow. Upwind, try and keep it nice and clean because you don't want a weedy fence row upwind of where you're trying to grow because any weeds that are in there that release seed are just going to blow into the area where you're trying to grow crops and things. Uh, so think about that as well. Uh, Sun Tzu from the Art of War, if you know your enemies and know yourself, you'll not be imperiled in a hundred battles. Weed ID is critical. Just because something looks like a grass doesn't mean it is a grass. Every year, guaranteed, I'll have at least one person will call me up and say, uh, I had nutgrass growing in my garden and I went out and I talked to the guy at Southern States or Walmart or True Value and he gave me this grass killer to kill grasses and it didn't touch the stuff. What did I do wrong? And I say, well, you didn't do anything wrong except you didn't figure out what the problem was before you went in and tried to deal with it because nutgrass is not a true grass plant. It doesn't have the same physiology. What people are calling nutgrass is actually a sedge plant. So it doesn't have the same physiology as a grass plant. So your graminicides aren't going to touch nutgrass. This is one of the books that I have on my shelf that I recommend. Even though we're not considered the Northeast, this is a very good book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon and your brick and mortar stores and everything else, Weeds of the Northeast. I like this one because it has nice color photographs in it, has very good description. At the bottom of the page opposite the pictures, it also has descriptions about what other weeds it could be confused with. Uh, so this is one I like, Weeds of Kentucky and Adjacent States. That's an old book, has line drawings in it. A uh, little bit geared more for Kentucky, but I think this covers 80% of what the issues are that you're gonna run into. As far as online resources, the Weed Science Society of America has very good photo gallery of pictures out there. Uh, if you ever get bored, I advise you to check out the Weed Science Society of America pages. Uh, lots of interesting stuff there. The USDA Plants Database is also very good. Uh, they've just updated their website. They used to have static maps, but now they have those uh, scalable vector maps where you can zoom in on things and see to the county level sometimes where various weed problems are and things. So those are just a couple of the resources that I recommend uh, that you should make yourself familiar with. Mm -hmm.